And good evening. We begin tonight at five with troubling new details emerging around the timeline of the elementary school shooting in Uvalde, Texas. Authorities now say the gunman who massacred 21 people was in the building for more than an hour before law enforcement killed him. And that is spurring both anger and frustration from families of victims who understandably want to know why police did not storm the building sooner. Authorities now say the gunman entered Robb Elementary through an unlocked door. Officers are there, the initial officers, they receive gunfire. They don't make entry initially because of the gunfire they're receiving. But we have officers calling for additional resources. Everybody that's in the area. But before that, the investigators say the 18 year old gunman shot his grandmother at her home and then crashed his truck near the school. Now 12 minutes passed between that crash and when he entered the building, authorities were not able to explain why he was not stopped in that window. And tonight we are hearing more stories connected to victims and survivors. NBC talked to one woman who says her 11 year old niece was in that classroom when the shooter started firing a warning here. The details here are graphic. They are tough to listen to what this young girl went through as her aunt tells it in order to make it out alive. Mia um, got some blood and put it on herself, but she can pretend that she was dead. So I said that she um, she saw her her friend full of blood and she got blood and put it on herself. Yeah, no child should have to go through that 11 years old, 19 children, two teachers, a total of 21 people died in the shooting. And today in yet another tragedy, family of one of those teachers, Irma Garcia, say her grieving husband has also died. They say Joe Garcia had just returned home from dropping off flowers at a memorial when he collapsed and couldn't be revived. Joe and Irma were high school sweethearts married for 24 years. And of course, all this reigniting the nationwide debate on gun control and firearm safety today on Capitol Hill. There's even some talk from both parties about potential for bipartisan compromise. It won't be everything I want. It won't be universal background checks. It likely won't be a ban on assault weapons, but you know, maybe it's an expansion of background checks. We're going to try to work through this and see if we can find that common ground. And let us hope they can find it. The issues are front and center locally to a group called Lift Every Voice Oregon now ramping up its efforts to try to get stricter gun safety measures onto the ballot in November. Mike Benner joins us now. And Mike, how close are they to making that actually happen? Well, David, they've collected approximately 30,000 signatures. They need 112,000 signatures. Some may argue that is a steep hill to climb ahead of the July 8th deadline. But look at it like this. Right now, there are between 50,000 and 60,000 petitions out across the state. If each one of these petitions comes back with at least two signatures, well, then Lift Every Voice Oregon has succeeded. And boy, are they hoping for that. The group gathered at Augustana Lutheran Church in Northeast Portland this morning. This was a rally of sorts. This group won stricter gun measures on the November ballot. This boils down to permits and thorough background checks for all gun purchases while banning large capacity magazines. As the group points out, nobody needs magazines of 30 rounds or more. It's just not necessary. They say to get this senseless gun violence under control, it is time to act now. We do not have to endure this. We do not have to treat this as normal. We do not have to treat this as something we can't affect. We can make a difference. We will make a difference. We are going to change the narrative right now because we are angry. All right, Lift Every Voice Oregon is also pushing a measure that would ban the future sale of assault style weapons. You won't find that on the ballot though. The hope is that state legislators pick that up uh, sometime next year and run with it. Only time will tell. We'll of course stay on top of it. In the meantime, if you want to learn more about Lift Every Voice Oregon's efforts, you can head to our website, kgw.com. David. Mike Benner reporting. Thank you, Mike. And also here in the Portland area, there was a gun scare today at a Vancouver high school staff at Heritage High say a student brought an unloaded gun with them to class. The firearm was confiscated. Nobody was hurt. 
The Clark County Sheriff's Office and now District Security are investigating. In a letter to families, the principal, Derek Garrison, wrote in part, quote, We are cooperating with law enforcement's investigation and following our district's discipline and safety guidelines. Now, while this is ongoing at this time, we do not believe that the weapon was brought to school with the intent to harm staff or students. He went on to say, especially considering recent events, we know that incidents like this are highly concerning. Please know we take these situations very seriously and the safety of our students and staff is a priority here at Heritage High." End quote. Again, nobody was hurt. Well, developing tonight, the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office is looking for potential victims of a man they say impersonated a law enforcement officer. They say 31 year old Christopher Denton had been driving a decommissioned police vehicle and deputies say he used it. He used it to pass himself off as police. Investigators say Denton is also accused of unwanted and inappropriate contact with a woman dating back to 2018. Deputies are asking any potential victims to contact the sheriff's office. Denton is now being held right now on federal gun and drug related charges. Well, the family of Kevin Peterson Jr. is suing the Clark County Sheriff's Office. You may remember Peterson, who is black, was shot and killed by deputies back in October 2020 during a failed drug sting. Investigators later determined the deputies did not break any criminal laws in that shooting. Bryant Clerkley was at a news conference that Peterson's family held today to talk about that lawsuit. So, Brian, walk us through what they are hoping for here. Hey, David, the family hopes that law enforcement uh, officials, law enforcement officers can go through more training before they hit the streets. And they also want the officers or the deputies that shot Kevin Peterson to be held accountable. And the family says that they just want more justice. The lawsuit is against the Clark County Sheriff's Office, Sheriff Chuck Atkins and Deputy Jonathan Feller. Court documents say Clark County deputy shot Peterson after a drug sale of 50 Xanax pills to an informant at the Quality Inn in Hazeldale. Initially, Sheriff Chuck Atkins said Peterson fired a gun during his interaction with deputies. Two weeks later, investigators confirmed Peterson never fired a gun, but had one on him. The lawsuit says dep deputies wrongfully caused Peterson's death. The family says they want change. So I don't think we'll ever get any change until we see some people passing some real laws. We need some new voters. We need real change so we can have a difference, a life, have, a, have more children. I want them alive. The deputies involved were found to not be criminally liable for Peterson's death. An outside prosecutor found the shooting was justified and lawful. The prosecutor said deputies had the right to defend themselves since Peterson was armed. And I did reach out to the Clark County Sheriff's Office and they said that they are not commenting on the lawsuit at this time. And the attorney for the Peterson family, Mark Lindquist, says, you know, he wants to file this lawsuit um, to get more information or to subpoena more information about what happened to Kevin Peterson from the sheriff's office. David. Brian Clerkley in Clark County. Thank you, Bryant. An update on COVID-19 as case counts continue to rise in both Oregon and Washington and state officials in Washington echoing what we've seen in places like Multnomah County. They are recommending people mask up in crowded indoor spots. Tim Gordon has more. The COVID-19 pandemic proving once again it's not over. Omicron's BA2 variant causing a continuing surge. In Washington, both Governor Jay Inslee and the Lieutenant Governor report having COVID with mild symptoms. Now state health officials are recommending the use of masks inside in crowded or tight quarters. What does that tell you about where we're at as a state right now? Yeah, I mean, we are seeing a lot of COVID-19 and, and we've seen, you know, COVID rates go up over the last couple of months. Clark County Deputy Health Officer Stephen Krager says it's even more stark when you consider lots of people are testing at home and not reporting results. Right now, there's a lot of COVID-19 in the community. In Clark County, the latest weekly report shows 217 new COVID cases per 100,000 residents. That's up from 165 the week before and from about 35 per 100,000 just over a month ago. Hospital admission rates in Clark County are up too, but not as dramatically. Still, 15% of hospital beds are now occupied by COVID patients or those under investigation for the disease, and 31% of ICU beds fall into that category. 
We're still seeing people being hospitalized. We're still seeing people dying from COVID-19. Um, and, and, and so we'd love to, you know, turn the corner on this kind of current surge. The bright spot, Krager says modeling indicates a peak may be close. Although even still that modeling suggests um, the downturn will be slow, so we'll still be at rather high rates for a while. In Oregon, COVID cases are also up. Oregon's daily case average is at 1,650, up from 1,468 a week ago. So wherever you are in the Pacific Northwest, Dr. Krager's suggestions seem wise. We can be flexible in kind of what we do and decide to mask and decide to test. Um, we can also just step back and make our lives safer by, by vaccinating and then accessing treatment um, if we end up getting sick. Now, Dr. Krager says if you do get sick, having a treatment plan is important. And the drug Paxlovid is a great option. It cuts the risk of hospitalization or death by 90% if it's taken within the first five days of infection. In Clark County, Tim Gordon, KGW News.